The new 2020 Triumph Tiger 900 has loads of improvements on the last model. There are better brakes in the form of Brembo style lemmas with braided hoses and a radial master cylinder, a new lighter frame and bolt on subframe, and a split radiator to allow the front wheel to travel whilst the engine has been moved forward to improve balance and stability. Four of the five models in the range get a larger 7-inch display, an IMU which introduces cornering ABS and traction control, heated grips, illuminated switches and cruise control. The two premium pro models also get phone connectivity, an up and down quick shifter, heated seats and tyre pressure monitoring and the GT Pro gets an electronically adjustable rear shock. The styling has also been overhauled with a leaner, more aggressive look finished off with LED lighting all round. It's a huge leap forward for the Tiger, but then again, a lot of these features are just par for the course in the 2020 middleweight adventure bike market. What's always made the Tiger stand out from the crowd is its triple cylinder engine when set against the raft of twins. And what makes the Tiger 900 stand apart from previous Tigers is a new 132 firing order with irregular firing intervals. Triumph claimed that this will give the new bike more low down pull like a twin whilst maintaining the top end burst of a triple. But is it just marketing bullshit or have Triumph genuinely created a different feel to their other triple cylinder motorcycles? I went on the press launch in Morocco to find out. But to truly appreciate change, you have to understand where you're starting from. And Triumph East London were kind enough to lend me one of their last Tiger 800s so I could take it out for a couple of hours to get reacquainted. So this 2018 model, like Tigers before it and the other triples in the Triumph range, like the Street Triple and the Speed Triple, has a 1-2-3 firing order with evenly spaced firing intervals. So it's a 120 crank and that's got to go twice round because it's a four stroke. So it's a 240 degree firing interval. So with each of the three cylinders firing at even intervals, you get a very smooth sound out of the exhaust. It's almost like a buzz. In terms of what it's like to ride, I mean, I didn't off-road it. It's a dealer's demo bike after all, but on the road, it's very smooth. I mean, a triple's like a, a happy compromise, really. It doesn't feel gutless at low revs like an inline four might, and it has a bit more headroom than some twins where they die off a bit when the revs pick up. It makes for a really easy, predictable, and smooth bike to ride but it does surprise you just how much it revs up. If you've ridden a street triple or a speed triple, it feels a bit like those. It feels a bit like a sports bike at times. Fast forward a few days and I arrived at the hotel in Marrakesh and got my first glimpse of the new bike. Later that evening, we had the technical briefing, which gave me the perfect opportunity to speak to Triumph's chief product officer, Steve Sargent, to tell us more about the changes they've made to the Tiger. I rode a Tiger 800 earlier this week yep. for a bit of a comparison before I came out here. Yeah. Speaking to the guy in the dealer, he had a Tiger 800 and he was talking about how he loved that you could green lane it, but equally it's a great road bike as well because mm. that motor revs up yep. uh, and he was even talking about one of his customers uh, taking it around Brands Hatch yeah, <laughs> on okay. a track day. All right. uh, so given that the character of the triple was so well liked, what made you decide to make such a 
big change to it with the firing order. Yeah, I mean, I, I had a Tiger 800 for you, and I, I absolutely loved it. You know, it's right? The, it's you're absolutely right. It's the kind of bike you can tour on it, you can commute on it, you can green lane on it. Yeah, you know, and it does all those things really, really well. When we went out and started talking to customers, one of the things that um, came back was from guys who. Um, ride the bike off road mm. they were saying that the engine's nice it's lovely and smooth but when you're riding and doing low speed maneuvers mm -hmm. the engine feels like it wants to spin up right you know it's a real kind of free-flowing engine when you ride uh, something that is like a v-twin or a parallel twin mm -hmm. they felt that the connection and the feel between the throttle and the rear wheel on a twin Right. Gave, gave them more control in conditions that you know are not perfect, whether that's gravel or mud or whatever. That kind of got our cogs whirring a little bit in terms of, well, you know, okay, if that's, if that's what people are asking for, you know, we don't want to develop a twin because, you know, that's not what right. we're all about with the Tigers. The Tigers are, are, are triples and they've got their own advantages, particularly when you're doing that kind of distance work and commuting. Yeah. Sure. So, so we didn't want to lose what we've got in terms of having a triple, but how do we deliver what the customers are saying in terms of giving them a better feel yeah. and, a, and a better tractability low down? Mm. And some of the solutions to that are the fact that, you know, a, a twin has bigger spacing between the firing pulses fundamentally. Yeah. You know, how, how can we do that with a triple? You know, there's a bit of brainstorming going on and a few different options. So could we have two cylinders firing at the same time and then one firing separately. Right. So, <laughs> That's yeah, which, is, which, can, there. which could be done. Right, okay. Um, but that, you know, creates, creates some other issues around vibration and stuff like that. Of course, yeah. Um, why don't we come up with a crank configuration that spaces out the firing pulses on two of the firing pulses and shortens mm -hmm. it on the other. So you still get that feel of having um, bigger space in between the firing pulses. But then when the engine starts to spin, it still feels smooth. Okay. Um, so that's, that's, that's really where it started from. So can you talk us through a bit of the kind of technical specifics around it, the, the exact changes you've made? Yeah, so effectively, if you look at the crankshaft from the side, yeah. you know, you've got the, the crank center, and then the crank pins for the, you know, the three conrods are effectively spaced at 90 degrees. So you say you've got one at the top, one at 90 degrees to that, and one at, one at the bottom. Okay. Um, and the way the engine fires, it fires cylinder one first, it rotates through 180 degrees, then it fires uh, cylinder three, mm -hmm. it then spins through 270 degrees before it goes back to cylinder two, and then another 270 to get back to cylinder one again. Right. So, whereas in the past the uh, firing sequence was 240, 240, 240, yeah. so, you know, absolutely even firing pulses between the three super smooth, super responsive. Mm -hmm. What you've got now is you've got two longer firing pulses in there that, that create that, that feel more like a twin lowdown. And you can hear it in the sound as well. We've heard yeah. the bikes outside. It's, it's, it's a smooth buzz, isn't it, on the old Tiger 800, but yeah. it's much more of a kind of rough note yeah. to it now. I mean, I think most people who um, you know, maybe don't know what we've done with the engine, if they heard it go past, I guarantee most people wouldn't think it was a triple. Right, because it doesn't doesn't sound like a triple. Now, as far as we are aware, nobody has ever done this crank configuration on a triple before. There's more talk on this bike, mm. but also we've got the firing order change. And, and you've said in the technical briefing that that changes the, the low end pull or feel. So what's the relationship between the extra displacement and, and the effect that that has on the motor and the firing order? What's responsible for what change in the, in the specs or the, the performance figures, let's say? Yeah, so obviously we've increased the capacity to take it up to the, the 900cc version. Yeah. And uh, increased capacity will give you more torque. So mm -hmm. effectively that gives you more pull throughout the rev range, you know, at the low end and uh, through the mid range, all the way up to peak power at 95 PS. Right. So that gives you the more torque. The firing pulses gives you the, really the feel mm -hmm. between the, the throttle and the rear wheel. So 
the, the, the two things combined, you know, really delivers something that feels really nice, but it also has got a nice response to it. And as I've said, really excited to get on the bike tomorrow and see how it feels. What do you think I'll notice? It doesn't have to be limited to the engine, by the way. Yeah. So there's lots of other changes, but what do you think I'll notice versus the Tiger 8? So you'll, you'll definitely notice the engine, the sound and the feel of the en engine is so different to the Tiger 8. But I think the other thing you'll notice is, you know, we've got a five kilo weight reduction on here, but that's only part of the story. Probably the bigger part of the weight story is the fact that we've managed to lower the center of gravity. Right. So we've managed to um, lower the engine mm -hmm. um, and move it further forwards and tilt it further forwards. So that really makes the bike feel a lot more agile and nimble, you know, not just on the road, but also when you're off road. Mm. But even though we've lowered the engine in the frame, we've actually increased the ground clearance because we've revised the sump. Okay. So the sump sits a little bit higher. So I think you'll get a great feel from the engine. Right. But in terms of what the bike feels like to ride and handle, yeah. I think that's also going to be a, a nice surprise for you. Okay, looking forward to it. All right. Thank you very much. All right, cool. Cheers. Cheers. It all sounds good in theory, but it was time to get some miles in and find out what the new Tiger 900 is really like. The first day was road focused with some A-road type riding before we hit the twisties in the national parks. And then we spent the second day riding off-road on the endless miles of dusty, gravelly and sandy trails you get out there. It was an incredible couple of days riding and an incredible bike to do it on. Whilst the street was being hosed down at the hotel ready for the next day's journalists, I took the chance to reflect on the bike. So the first day on the motorway, not exactly the most inspiring riding environment, but it does give you a chance to get to play with all the gadgets and stuff while you're cruising along. The screen is much bigger than the last model, really easy to read, lots of different options for how it's arranged and that sort of thing. We also use the phone connectivity for the navigation as well, which was good to see. It's turn by turn, so you don't get a map like you do on some bikes but even so, like the symbols are very clear, it's really easy to follow. It's now got cruise control, so that's obviously very handy in those situations as well. You can nudge it up and down one or two miles an hour, rather than some bikes where you just kind of press it and it sets one speed. It was also a little bit foggy and cool on that morning, surprisingly cool actually, considering we're in Morocco, but the heated seats, of course, were pretty handy and heated grips, so that was a nice opportunity to switch those on and get a little bit toasty, especially when you're doing motorway speeds. And then of course on the GT Pro, the electronically adjustable shock. So you can do preload, so there's four settings for rider only, rider with luggage and then two up and two up with luggage. But you can also change the damping as well, so you can put it in a comfort mode and then there's about 10 grades towards a sporty mode, the middle being a kind of normal compromise setting. I quite like that actually, it really does cushy up the rear end and then when you do put it into the sporty setting, yeah you can really feel it firm up and it handles better of course. It's a bit of a shame the front isn't electronically adjustable as well, you could always pull over and change it but then what's the point in having an electric shock if you're gonna have to go and twiddle the front forks at the side of the road anyway. When you firm the damping up for the sportier riding, you know the rear feels like it's a bit more taut and that kind of makes sense. When you put it into comfort mode, because the forks aren't changed as well, it does feel a little bit like you're starting to sit back like on a chopper or something. But all the same, it's still a nice feature to have. When we got onto the kind of more interesting roads, the twisties, some higher speed bends, you got to get a feel for the brakes as well. They're massively improved over the Tiger 800. These are Brembo style Emmas now, radial monoblock calipers, four pots on either disc, a radial master cylinder, and the discs are bigger as well. They're 320 mils now rather than 300. So all around the braking at the front, it feels way crisper than the two pot 300 mil Brembos of the last bike. Had an absolute blast off-roading today. Absolutely loved it and really enjoyed the bike as well. I didn't ride the Tiger 800 off-road, of course, that's a dealer's bike, so I don't wanna be bringing it back dropped, but they've made changes to this model to try and make it a little bit better off-road. So the seat's narrower, which helps you reach the floor, of course, but also contributes to being able to maneuver the bike well. It's lighter as well, five kilograms, that's not insignificant. And of course, they move the engine forward to change the balance of the bike. So those are some of the factors that might contribute to it feeling 
pretty nice off-road. You've got a load of riding modes as well, so there's road, rain, sport, off-road and rider configurable. On the rally models you get off-road pro as well, so off-road has I think about 70% ABS they were saying on the front, a little bit of ABS on the rear and the traction control is not very invasive. Off-road pro there's a lot less intervention so you can kind of slide it around more and lock the back up and skid it. I barely ride off-road at all so I had it in off-road in the morning as I was getting into it, getting a bit more confident, loosening up and it just gave me that little bit of extra peace of mind let's say uh, while I was just getting my eye in. In the afternoon I switched over to off-road pro probably if you're a better rider than me it, it feels way more natural I didn't notice a huge difference because I was nowhere near the limits of the bike but of course as your riding progresses it's always nice to have the option to to try out those more advanced techniques but mainly I, I like the ability to switch between but you know a lot of this video has been about the changes to the engine and so I'll talk about that a little bit now it still has that revy nature it still goes on and on when I was on the road riding you know sometimes you think you're revving it and then you bang it down another gear and it can keep going I think it's just so versatile for that reason it kind of operates like two separate bikes you know you've got that sporty road bike for the first day get into the trails and then on the trails you know we're near revving it that hard but it's got a different character definitely the exhaust note gives that sense of a rougher meaner twinier type bike And yeah, it does have a nice feel to it off-road. It's really usable down low. But I think it's really that extra displacement that gives you that extra torque and power across the rev range that means that it just feels really nice in the mid-range. When you're on the road, that's more realistically where you're gonna be riding it around four, five, six thousand revs, and it's just got a lovely feel to it. Some people might be super fond of that old one, two, three firing order on the Tiger. You know, it's what it's known for. But if you were maybe thinking it was a bit boring or a bit droney and you wanted something with a bit more character or something that sounded a bit more aggressive then definitely go and check one of these out. A middleweight adventure bike ought to be an all-rounder and Triumph have created just that. A revy road bike with a quick shifter and crisp braking and a capable tourer with an adjustable screen, cruise control, phone navigation, heated seats and grips and enough power to carry a passenger and luggage. And previously where the Tiger had perhaps fallen short off-road because of its revy nature, they've given it more feel at low revs with the new firing order. It's also slimmed down in both width and weight with a revised weight distribution and some forgiving electronic aids completing a capable bike for the trails. I certainly enjoyed this bike and I'm sure you will too if you take one out for a spin when they hit dealers in the next month, wherever you decide to take it.